The Joe Biden administration made a fresh bid to reach out to African leaders during the US African Leaders Summit held in Washington DC from December 13 to 15. The summit takes place at a time when both China and Russia have established different kinds of presence in Africa. The US government tried to give the impression that the summit was not about its international rivals, but the subtext was clearly there. How do current geopolitical and economic developments influence the US outreach to African countries? What were some of the key announcements and outcomes of the summit? Well, for the United States, it was a wake-up call when the heads of government of Africa didn't support or line up behind the US position regarding the war on Ukraine. You know, many of them took quite independent positions. Several heads of government went to Moscow in this intervening several months. Um, even countries that were quite closely aligned to the United States didn't take the US position in public. You know, many of them wanted to essentially have a kind of non-aligned view between um, the Russians and the United States. Well, you know, it's true, of course, that the US has watched with some alarm over the course of the past several years, maybe six years or so, that um, China has increased its investments on the African continent. It's a principal investor on the continent, about four times greater by volume than US investments and a different character of investment because a lot of Chinese investment is in infrastructure building, whereas a lot of US investment is in fact in extractive industries. Um, so the US has been alarmed by this. They've also been alarmed by the entry of several hundred Russian um, mercenaries associated largely with the Wagner group, not only in Mozambique, um, but in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Libya, and in most recently Burkina Faso. So the US has been pretty alert to this because they kind of thought that, you know, the African continent, the US and France has a kind of lock on it, but not so. In fact, a number of African states are asserting their independence. Um, they don't want to be, you know, either the front or backyard of the United States, France, or Russia or China. They want to assert their own independence. And so as a way to um, uh, reassert their independence or, well, putting it another way to recolonize Africa, the United States had a white paper out strategic document which talked about the strategy for U.S. to assert its control. And then in mid-December, three-day summit, the U.S.-Africa summit held in Washington, um, where they sat and discussed, you know, a range of things, including the problems of food price inflation um, and, 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 of course, the issue of Russia and China. Strikingly, the most important issue to African countries, since 60 percent of them are struggling um, with a very, very dangerous debt crisis, that issue of debt was not on the table. It was not discussed by anybody. Um, it was all about, in a way, the new Cold War. It was all about the United States trying to reassert itself as the principal power on the African continent. In the last day, the United States decided to pledge $55 billion to the African continent. That's roughly $1 billion per country. It's interesting when you look at the character of the aid. Um, well, there was about $150 for elections. This was comical. Uh, on Wednesday, one of the days of the summit, Mr. Biden took aside several uh, leaders of countries who were going to come up for elections and basically apparently lectured them on the importance of free and fair elections. A very curious thing that happened. One of the people taken aside was Mohammed, Mohammed Buhari of Nigeria, um, an expert in, in how to win elections. Um, and, you know, these were all men, uh, octogenarians, nontogenarians, who have not really had a free and fair election in a long time. It was curious that the US decided to pull this public relations move uh, against them. It's curious because you're not going to make friends like that. But anyway, that's a separate issue. Um, the bulk of the money pledged, in fact, for combating food insecurity looked to me to be in the realm of public private partnerships. This was going to be money that essentially would subsidize US multinational corporations to enter and take advantage of African soil and African markets didn't look to me like um, an investment program for the African continent it looked more like a subsidy program for US multinationals. But of course, that's not how it's being reported in the press. They just have the banner number 55 billion as if that's a lot of money. In fact, that's not a very 
great deal of money for a very large continent with a great deal of complicated problems um, who are trying to manage their own foreign policy between the United States, Russia and China. They really don't want to get caught up in the ugly choices of this new Cold War. For countries of the diverse continent, there are tough choices to make. On the one hand, there is a groundswell of people's anger against the presence of Western troops in many countries. At the same time, the US seeks to intensify its military and strategic presence in the continent. Meanwhile, China's presence has been marked by a focused economic plan for many countries, which is an attractive offer for them. How do governments manage to strike a balance between various foreign players even while dealing with pressures from their population against militarization and imperialism? You know, Africa is a very diverse continent, many different currents taking place in the Sahel region, in Mali, in Burkina Faso and so on. We've seen a, a real uh, rising up of people against the French intervention through Operation Barkhane. The French have been essentially removed from Mali and Burkina Faso. On the other side in Ghana, we see the entry of the United States taking over a terminal in Accra's airport. We see the entry most likely of UK troops into Ghana through the Accra initiative. So very strange, different things happening in different parts of the continent. But let's focus on Zambia, which has been an interesting place. High debt problems, uh, once again, back to the International Monetary Fund. Um, the Chinese government came in and basically um, tore up pieces of paper for loans. Some loans were forgiven and so on. And then in the middle of all this, um, the uh, Zambian government decides to cut a deal with the Democratic Republic of Congo and the United States um, around basically battery making. Now, what's interesting is the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia already had an agreement uh, to do some sort of collaborative work on creating an electric battery. There was no need for the U.S. to be part of this deal, but the U.S. inserted itself. This shows the political weakness in some of these countries. You know, here was a situation where both the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia already had an agreement, already had a plan to build an electric battery, um, you know, uh, supply chain and so on. They would have perhaps done it on their own. And yet here the United States, um, you know, in a sense, really frustrated by the Chinese entry into these countries, inserts itself. And I would say arm twist Zambia and Democratic Republic of Congo to allow a new agreement to be created, which is um, between the three countries. So that's a sign of the weakness of countries. Again, it's it's a patchy, um, you know, uh, situation in some countries. They are ejecting like the French in other countries. They are forced to bring in the United States. So, I mean, we have to look and see. It's very difficult to generalize, as you said.